money we put on it. Um, so this is our, I consider this kind of a series of two lectures on animal calculations and uh, animal tools. So we'll start uh, in this lecture just learning how an estimated order calculation is performed. Uh, so what does it mean to do an estimated order calculation? Mm -hmm. And uh, then we'll move on to, first of all, look to a series of uh, examples uh, which we'll see what's the benefit of having an excellent order calculation when it's not enough. And uh, then we we'll wanted to learn which kind of tools are available to us uh, to perform an excellent order calculation or to use an excellent order calculation. So this is the outline of this lecture and apart from setting the frame, so setting the basic concepts of the terminology that we're going to use, uh, something that probably you already know from a pre-existing uh, knowledge or from uh, previous lectures at these schools. We will move on to the real structure of the next learning model calculation, discussing mutual and real connections and uh, how to approach them in particular in the business of counseling uh, the divergences that you encounter along your way. And then we we'll move on to what I was saying. So a series of examples that will allow us to appreciate what we gain from an estimating order calculation and when this is not enough. Now, to set the frame, uh, first of all, uh, let me say that uh, in, as in, during these lectures, uh, we focus on QCD. So more than what you need to know as basics has been covered uh, in the introductory lesson by the QCD. And uh, the reason why we do that, and the reason why I do that, is just because uh, I will be focusing on hardware problems. The close and uh, the present and close future physics uh, that we are going to lead to is a physical hadron collider. So I think it makes sense to focus on these lectures on hadron colliders. And a hadron collider is, of course, the most important uh, concern that you have is just to understand very well QCD. That's the reason why we focused on that during this lecture. <laughs> Now, we will uh, uh, learn about uh, the properties uh, of an absolute leading order calculation, uh, first in general, and along the way I will use from time to time a sort of prototype example. And the prototype example that I decided to use uh, is the production of top pairs, hydronic production of top pairs. And the reason for that is just that because it's a uh, 2 2 2 so relatively kinematically simple uh, uh, process, uh, fully hydronic. And also because I'm going to give at the end the third lecture, which is on top physics, so I figured that I would pick an example that uh, will be meaningful to our third lecture. So that's the reason why we are going to use the bar production. Now, <coughs> we will talk uh, in, in that case of, all about the first order of QCD correction, because it's an estimating order calculation, we will see something about both the total and differential cross sections. In so doing, I will assume some basic knowledge. As you see, I'll introduce all the concepts uh, that you need and I will give you details in these lectures about how to go over a calculation. But of course, uh, if I will assume that you have been already probably exposed once to the very basic concepts, uh, maybe the, not more than in the context of quantum electrodynamics or in the context of QE. <coughs> and that when I talk about basic concepts, I talk about uh, the perturbative calculation of the cross sections, <coughs> Kinetic diagrams and so on, the origin of ultraviolet and infrared divergences, the regularization and renormalization of ultraviolet divergences, and the cancellation of infrared divergences for infrared safe observables. So I'm going, I'm going to uh, give more details on some of these issues, uh, but of course I'm not going to explain renormalization again. So you, that's what I mean when I, when I uh, say that I assume some basic knowledge. Now, as <clears throat> always to set the frame, let's uh, set the basic picture of uh, a proton, 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 antiproton collision uh, and how you go calculating the cross section, both differential cross section and total cross section for that process. This is a very uh, naive uh, representation of that process, and you have seen probably more sophisticated uh, representations uh, in the first lectures that you have uh, assisted to in this school. But just to fix the, the ideas, we know that we can calculate uh, <coughs> hydrogen cross sections, uh, so proton, proton, and proton, and by proton cross section, uh, through the property of factorizations of QCD, of strong interactions. Uh, and this property tells us that we can calculate it in terms uh, of the partial level cross section, which is, uh, is it for a pointer somewhere? I need to 
build it first. <laughs> oh, you to build it. So to, uh, we can calculate through a partial level cross-section, which is the two sigma hat, which is in my formula, that is the cross-section for parton I and J in the proton and in the anti proton, so in the two hadrons, so to produce the final state uh, you are uh, looking for, which is uh, indicated generically by X. That one. You just have to push it. Oh, top button, the button in the corner. <coughs> Oh. Okay, I see. Thank you. <coughs> and you convolute it uh, with part of distribution functions, so probability of finding uh, the part of I and the part of J into hadron 1 or hadron 2 with a given fraction x1 and x2 of the momenta of uh, the parent hadron, so, so PP or PP bar. This factorization takes is uh, imposed or takes place, if you want, in a scale that I indicate here as mu sub f, which is the factorization scale. And uh, the total hadronic cross section is obtained as a sum of all the possible particles that can generate the final state x. So, this is the first step uh, in the calculation of the hadronic cross section. Now, in so doing, then uh, the problem reduces to how to calculate uh, higher order QCD corrections, so, so how to calculate in QCD the sigma hat cross section uh, and uh, the particle distribution functions that you have here. And you have already seen uh, probably a lot about uh, how to calculate uh, the evolution perturbatively, the evolution of the particle distribution function out of a non perturbative core that you measure experimentally from experimental data. Now, our main focus here will be on the next leading order calculation of the sigma hat, so the parton level cross section. Now, in so doing, uh, the, of course, uh, the partonic cross process, uh, which is uh, the process for parton i and j to produce the final state x. Uh, is complicated uh, by both initial and final state uh, radiation uh, and uh, this radiation can be both real and virtual so it can be things that are radiated and reabsorbed by the same initial and final state uh, lens uh, of the process. And how do we go including this in our calculation and taking this into account? Well, QCD itself at high energy gives us the answer for that. And the answer is in the fact that the coupling becomes really small at large energies. So the perturbative approach uh, is uh, justified. And the perturbative approach means that you make your cross-section, so your d sigma hat, that here I represent in all the ways a differential cross-section in such a way that it leaves our discussion a little bit more open. So the d sigma hat of the differential cross section part of level cross-section can be expressed as a perturbative series in the strong coupling constant that here I indicated with alpha s as I have here, and this is given by what you know, so the ratio of g s squared of i. Now, at each order, uh, we have a d sigma hat m, so the coefficient of the corresponding power of alpha s, which is the cross section of the <coughs> order uh, in the perturbative expansion. Here, I factor out the power of alpha s that I indicated as alpha s k, which is uh, the power of the leading order, so it's the power of the tree level process. The others are corrections. So, to, th to set the terminology, when we here have, uh, uh, I see that here there is a change in indices, so this should be an m, not an n. For n equals zero, we have the leading order of tree level or born level. For n equals one, we have the next leading order, so it includes all the alpha s corrections. So this is what we are going to uh, focus on, the first order of correction. Of course, at the same, uh, when you calculate something at a given order, you have to match properly the order of your perturbative expansion between uh, the sigma hat and the part of distribution function you are convoluting with. And you have uh, learned uh, during these lectures uh, how the evolution of the part of distribution function is perturbative and it can be calculated order by order. So you can calculate them a leading order and next leading order on higher through the DG lab equations. Now, one last issue in setting the framework is the, frame, is the issue of scale dependence on which we will return soon. But uh, you have already seen uh, in the second transparencies uh, that we have a factorization scale dependency in the game, which is the scale at which you factorize the short distance physics from the long distance physics, basically. <coughs> and then we also have in the game another scale, which is uh, the renormalization scale that we are involved with mu sub r. And this renormalization scale uh, comes into the picture because uh, at each order in the perturbative expansion, uh, the sigma hat that you encounter, so, so a next to leading order as a next to next to leading order as well before, <coughs> contains divergences uh, that are of ultra valid origin. So divergences that, that arises when the scale of momentum becomes large. And these divergences, you know, that are cured are not a problem of the theory because we know that QCD is a renormalizable theory. So they are cured introducing a finite number of types uh, of counter terms. And this is true order by order in the perturbative expansion. 
So we're gonna not worry about them. You have to introduce the proper counter terms in your calculation, but after you do that, uh, the calculation is ultra valid finite. Still, <laughs> when you truncate your perturbative expansion at a given order, uh, there is a leftover of the subtraction scale, as there is a leftover of the, of the factorization scale that stays in your finite order cross-section. So at the next you can order cross-section, for instance. And gives you a dependence uh, not only on mu f, but the dependence also on mu r. And it's a dependence that is uh, in the running of the in the running coupling, so in alpha s, and the dependence that is explicitly also in the cross section, uh, this in my head, at each order in the perturbative expansion. Now, uh, <coughs> if we set to for convenience uh, the two scales, one equal to the other, and we call uh, globally this is a scale, the scale dependence of our of our uh, prediction, of our physical prediction for the cross section, this is what uh, the initial formula that we have on the blackboard looks like uh, when we introduce uh, both the randomization uh, and the factorization scale dependence. So there is a scale dependence in the part of distribution function, there is a scale dependence uh, in the small public <coughs> process by itself, and there is a scale dependence in the seed by head of each order in the perturbative expansion. And uh, what we see, and what we will see in the second, uh, well, after the next transparency probably, is just that the residual scale dependence should improve with the perturbative order starting at the given point. So that's one of the main reasons uh, why to go up in perturbative work. So why to calculate higher order corrections so to measure physical cross sections. So let coming to the general structure of an extra-leading order calculation. Here is again uh, the formula I reproduced the, in, in a short, kind of shortened notation the formula that you had in the previous transparencies. It were the only thing that is made explicit apart from the structure is the scale dependence. And what we are interested in is calculating uh, the next to the uh, cross section. So we focus now on the uh, goal of this lecture, so calculating the first order of QCD correction to our three level cross section for a generic process that here is not specified yet. So the, our goal will be to calculate the D sigma hat, as we have already emphasized in the introduction uh, in setting the frame to this lecture. And the D sigma hat that is written here is made of two pieces. It's made of uh, the leading order part, so the three level part that is there, and the corrections. And the corrections are here represented with the delta D sigma and alone. So this is uh, truly speaking what we are going to talk about in detail, because this is trivial, this is just a three level part. That you can calculate, and when you calculate it into a next to leading order cross section, of course, you want to use in calculating this leading order little piece next to leading order parameters. So, the only parameter is typically depend on is alpha s, and alpha s will have to be used at next to leading order in this little piece here in order for your final D sigma NLO to be a truly NLO quantity. Now, let's focus on the delta, so the truly alpha s or order alpha s correction. Those are made of two pieces, right? as in QED, exactly the very same way. They're made of a virtual piece and of a real piece. So it's radiation of uh, quark and gluons from your original process, uh, a radiation now uh, that is uh, either of particles that are emitted a real sort, which is a virtual piece, or radiation of particles that stay a real particle. This is the terminology, virtual and real. Right? So this object here, the virtual part, has the same final state as the leading order, the real part has a final state that has one extra particle, so one extra particle in the final state because it's real radiation. Now, <coughs> this is specified here, and uh, of course you will match this next to leading order prediction for the sigma hat with the next to leading order part distribution functions in order to obtain a fully next to leading order hadronic cross section. Now, how do you do? How do you go calculating uh, both the virtual and the real part? Well, first of all, you have uh, in the virtual part you have ultraviolet divergences. Both in the virtual and in the real part, you have infrared divergences. You want to renormalize, first of all, the ultraviolet divergences. And this is typically the easy part of the calculation because it's very standard. We know what the counter terms of QCD are. You just need to fix a renormalization prescription. So to decide what your renormalization prescription is, and then to implement it, basically, in a consistent way. For the, uh, as far as the infrared divergences goes, you need to calculate both the virtual and the real part and uh, take into account mass factorization into the PDF before you see a cancellation of the infrared divergences. And infrared divergences normally comes uh, at, le at least at the level of the virtual calculation uh, into diagrams that are more complicated to be calculated. So that's the reason why the, calcul the calculation of the infrared part is typically the real hardware of the calculation. So it's typically the, the difficult part of the calculation. Typically, 
we use uh, in order to regularize the both ultraviolet and infrared divergences before we can calculate them, extract them, and cancel them, we use uh, dimensional regularization. This is what normally since uh, the modern day has been done. Dimensional regularization, as you know, changes the dimension of the momentum space on which you integrate from four dimensions to four minus a little epsilon. And for convenience, typically that epsilon is made a two epsilon. And here I just uh, distinguish between the epsilon that you use for the ultraviolet and the epsilon that you use for the infrared just for clarity, not because it's so in, in practical calculation, you always call it epsilon, that's fine. When you know where to pick up the ultraviolet part and when to pick up the infrared part. But for your uh, convenience, I just have them separate just to make sure that it's clear that there are two different processes here, two different steps. And of course, it's important at the end to check the new dependence of your uh, cross section. So, why do I stress this? Well, I stress this because this is a really important check of your calculation. Because, as a matter of fact, before you start, you know what the new dependence, the leftover new dependence of your calculation should be when you go at a certain order in the fertility test. And I give my next response is a little bit more details on the issue scale depends because it's really crucial and it's really important because most of a lot of what you do in order to calculate the, one of the main reasons why you go an absolute order or higher is just to improve on the scale dependence. So it's good for you to see what the scale dependence is coming in. Why do you know what the scale dependence of uh, the calculation at the order you are should be? And in particular, why do you know that it's going to be higher order with this particular order that you do the calculation? So if you do the calculation at the order alpha s k plus 1, where k is the alpha s power of the born, and k plus 1 is the alpha s power of the next leading order, how do you know that alpha s k, the new dependence that is left over is of order alpha s k plus 2, so it's one order higher than alpha s. It's very simple, it's a very simple calculation, and it's just based on the fact that you know that the total cross-section, so when you sum over all the possible perturbative orders that you have, is clearly new independent because it's a physical order, right? So it does not have any new dependence. So at a given order, you may impose that that order, the new dependence is canceled. So if you do that for your next to leading order calculation, well, uh, you see that let's, if you rewrite for convenience uh, the next to leading order cross-section in this uh, sort of uh, expanded form uh, in alpha s, uh, in which uh, I just uh, factor out the power of alpha s of the born. This is uh, the corresponding of sigma and O that I had in the previous transparencies. And then here are the corrections uh, split into two terms. So the first term that uh, is not, does not have any new dependence, and the second term that is uh, made of a coefficient times uh, the structure where the new dependence comes in, which is in log of the scale. Okay? So if you so do, so if you adopt this parameterization of the NLO cross-section, this representation of the NLO cross-section, then this F1 bar, so the coefficient uh, of the log of the scale, can be calculated just by imposing that the electronic cross-section is scale independent at the order which you are. Things that should happen order by order in the perturbative expansion. And in so doing, in so doing <coughs> we are talking here about uh, the hadronic cross-section, so you have to remember that in the hadronic cross-section there is sigma hat, and there are the part of distribution functions. And both of them depends on mu. Sigma hat depends on mu the way you have here. The part of distribution function depends on mu the way the uh, alternative equation tells you, the digital lab equation tells you. So the dependence of alpha s, uh, or the dependence of uh, the uh, coupling alpha s of mu is just regulated by the beta function of qc. And here is represented at the first order, which is the only one we need at this level. So it starts with the first coefficient and the uh, power of alpha s squared. When you look at uh, mu squared, the derivative of this which is mu squared of alpha s. And as I just said, uh, the mu dependence of the partial distribution function uh, is regulated by the revolution equation that you have seen probably in the introduction to this uh, school, in the introductory lectures to this school. So if you use these two simple facts, use just these two facts, you can calculate what that far one is out of the total of the, <coughs> the fact that the mu dependence of sigma of the hadronic cross-section and next to leading order has to be over the k plus 2. And uh, this is exactly what f1 comes out to be, and as you see, it depends just on b0, the coefficient, the first coefficient of the beta function, the leading order cross-section, and uh, the splitting functions so for uh, the, both uh, the <coughs> part of coming from hadron 1 and the part of coming from hadron 2. So it's predicted just by basic properties of QCD and the knowledge of the leading order cross-section. So the knowledge of the cross-section at the order before. So knowing the leading order cross-section, you know what uh, the new dependent part of the next leading order cross-section has to be. 
same thing, knowing the next leading order cross-section, uh, you would be able to predict uh, what the leftover mu dependence or the mu dependence of the next to next to leading order has to be because you do exactly the same game that you have here an equation which is more complicated because now you are uh, imposing your independence of the scale uh, at next to next to leading order. Now, this is the only thing, however, you can do, so you cannot predict the full cross-section just from the mu dependence because, of course, if you don't have the full calculation, you are missing this F1. You are only getting an F1 bar, right? So we are not saying that just out of this equation you get the full cross-section, you get the mu dependence. But it's very important uh, here to see two things, uh, or to see, first of all, uh, the cancellation of the mu dependence at the given order, and then to see that out of that, you can predict uh, the coefficient, uh, so you can predict which kind of leftover mu dependence you have. Now, <coughs> let's move on to an example, like the example that we are going to use in our calculation. In an illustrating the different points of an uh, SUV model calculation, we are now going into details. So we are now looking into details, uh, how are you going to calculate virtual and real corrections? I'm going to give you some methods, some, uh, if you want, standard procedures that are normally followed uh, in order to implement and to perform <coughs> these calculations. So here is uh, TT bar production a process that is of fundamental importance uh, at the Tevatron and will be at the LHC, a process that uh, we look at again when we talk about the top physics in more detail. Now, at the tree level, uh, here are the diagrams uh, that uh, you would consider, right? There is a possibility of producing a TT bar pair in the <coughs> state through quark contact quark collision, and there is a possibility of producing it via glucose. Right? Now, here I put a comment uh, that we will turn on uh, in the discussion of top physics, uh, but it's very simple, so I can, uh, I can make it to you right now. And it's the fact that this is the leading process at the Tevatron, and this is the leading process at the, SM, at the LHC. And uh, the reason for that is just related uh, to the scale uh, at which this process happens. Uh, that require quite some energy because you are producing two tops in the final state. So the tops are heavy, so you need quite a big amount of energy to produce them. And the Tevatron doesn't have a lot of central mass energy by the time you look at the particle level uh, at the S hat. So the particle level central mass energy that you have. So this process <coughs> at the Tevatron is quite impressive. So it produced four very large values of X in the particle distribution. And that's the reason why the quark part of distribution function prevails, it dominates. Right? And the LHC is quite the opposite, and that's the reason why this process is mainly dominated uh, by the blue blue initial state, because the blue PDFs are most important, because it's not produced at large X, it's produced at small X. That's the reason why, the reason of this distinction. And they're pretty, pretty, uh, they're, it's, it's not just a small distinction, if you look at the temperature, almost 90% of the cross-section is made of QQ bar. And when you look at the LHC, probably 70% or so of the cross-section is made of QQ. In any case, for the full next to leading order cross-section, you want to have both. So this is your tree level. And now, <coughs> the next to leading order cross-section for this process exists. It has been in the literature for many years now. And it was a big achievement, just the calculation now of by next to leading order, the calculation of next to leading order correction to massive torque production. So including the full mass effect. And this complicates a lot of the calculation that you to do, and that's the reason why it was a kind of pioneeristic calculation, both of them, when they appeared a sort of uh, 15 years ago or more. Now, how do you proceed uh, in calculating uh, both virtual and real corrections to this process? Well, for virtual and real correction are really exchange uh, of one extra pattern, uh, either reabsorbed by the same uh, patterns that are there at three level or emitted uh, if we are looking at the real corrections. Here, we start from the virtual corrections. So the order of S virtual correction. Now, the cross-section, the virtual part of the cross-section, so the D-sigma virtual IJ that uh, appeared uh, in uh, one of the first transparencies that we saw this morning, uh, is calculated in uh, here, it's, uh, it's a 2 to 2 process. So as I say, the virtual part has the same final state as the tree level, because uh, the part of the emitted is reabsorbed, uh, as you see from these many little diagrams that represent a sort of sample of all the diagrams that you have to calculate. Uh, and therefore, uh, there are two particles in the final state to start with, there are two particles in the virtual corrections as well. This is the reason of this DPS2, the integration over the phase space for two particles. Now, the other, the matrix element uh, that is integrated over this phase space is obtained uh, from, uh, as in, if you look at the Feynman that uh, corresponds to the virtual correction, you see that they are already order alpha s uh, more with this, but so they have already an extra order alpha s with this particular tree level. So in order to obtain uh, the correction to the first section at, at order alpha s, you have to interfere these diagrams with the tree level. Right? 
So this is exactly what is written here in the form of twice the real part uh, of the interference between the virtual amplitude uh, and uh, the born amplitude. So this is nothing else than A1 virtual A0 star plus A0 A1 virtual star. That would be so this is how you go calculate the differential cross-section. You plot the, the total cross-section and just integrate over the full space. Here is a sample of diagrams that you want to calculate. As you see, there are surface energy diagrams, so two-point functions related diagrams. There are vertex diagrams. There are box diagrams of different kinds depending on the initial state. Here are diagrams with the QQ bar initial state. Here are diagrams with the glue glue initial state. The order of difficulty in calculating the diagrams, of course, increases uh, with the topology. So surface energies are normally very easy, but these diagrams are very easy too. Box diagrams start becoming difficult. And you need to calculate them, in, at least in this introductory part of our approach to nicely linear the calculation. Let's say that you need to calculate them, and it's still the case of nowadays, to calculate them analytically, at least for what concerned, for what concerned their uh, divergent part. So the fact that they contain ultraviolet and infrared these diagrams, all of them, uh, some of them uh, contain intervalid divergences, and that is limited to self energies of vertex diagram, as you know from the properties of QCD, because you know from the regularized of QED, it's the same. So if you know from the property of the fact that the only divergent uh, uh, endpoint functions that you have uh, are two and three point functions, uh, and those uh, will be renormalized by introducing proper counter terms uh, for the two point function and the three point functions, uh, they also contain infrared divergences. Uh, most of them, all of them probably all of the diagrams that are depicted here on the blackboard. <coughs> the infrared divergences come from regions that will be detailed in the form. Now here is uh, the generic recipe that you follow or you can follow, right? That has slightly different approaches, but this is a very traditional one in order to calculate these diagrams. So of course you write the corresponding amplitude for each diagram that you have uh, and reduce the Dirac algebra. It's convenient to, to reduce the Dirac algebra to a well-defined set of Dirac structures. Okay. When you do that, your amplitude looks like a linear combination of Dirac structures with coefficients. Uh, and the coefficients uh, are uh, the hard uh, objects. So the coefficients are the objects uh, that contains uh, all the divergences uh, in the form of integrals uh, over the momentum space uh, of the loops uh, that are represented in the previous transparencies. Now, those integrals uh, are in the form of both tensor and uh, scalar integrals, and we we'll give more details uh, in the next transparencies. Uh, so, scalar integrals are, inter are integrals uh, with no Lorentz uh, no uh, <coughs> powers of, uh, of, the, of the loop momentum in the numerator of the integrals. Scalar integrals uh, are the ones, so scalar integrals are there, tensor integrals are the other way around. And it's canonical and typical to reduce tensor integrals to scalar integrals. And I'll tell you how you can do that and how many alternatives you have to do that. Now, scalar integrals are the, for the final building blocks of your calculation. That's a real thing that you need to calculate. And those are the objects that contain the divergences, both ultraviolet and infrared divergences. And you regularize them using dimensional regularization, let's just say. Then you remove uh, ultraviolet divergences that appear as poles uh, in one over the epsilon uh, that you introduce uh, for the regularization of the ultraviolet part, uh, and you remove them uh, using the subtraction method that you like uh, minimal subtraction, modified minimal subtraction, ocean subtraction, whatever is more convenient for your calculation or better physically justified for your calculation. And you calculate and single out infrared divergences uh, that are both in two, in three, and in four point functions just said, and you extract them in an absolute living order calculation as poles or double poles in the epsilon that you use for the regularization of the infrared part, so in the epsilon IR. Now, in the sum of the virtual, the real, and the part of the PDF mass subtraction, the, the infrared divergences will cancel. Now, here is an example, I figure that uh, <coughs> I needed to give you some more context uh, for this uh, terminology that we use of transfer and scalar integrals, probably many of you are very familiar with all this, probably you remember this from your QED calculation, even if you're not working on this, still let's look at what we mean by transfer and scalar integrals and how we proceed isolating the divergences or looking at the divergences, getting a feeling of the divergences that we have and uh, uh, reducing them to a final series of building blocks that we really calculate. Here is a very simple example of one of the diagrams that enter in our calculation of QQ bar to TT bar. And uh, this is a vertex correction here. I have detailed all the momenta that come into the loop that we have to calculate, which is uh, the triangle that we have here. The loop momentum is k, p1 and p2 are the external momentum of the two incoming quark and anti-quark. 
Clearly, this diagram is related to a real collection of this kind. So it's no wonder that if we have infrared divergences here, they will be calculated part in part by the infrared divergences that will appear in this diagram in the real collection. This is just a, a sort of a reminder, so that in the back of your mind, you keep in mind that this is going to happen at some point. Now, the amplitude, but for the time being, let's focus on the virtual part. The amplitude associated to this diagram uh, is of the following form, where here the proportional mean that I haven't written couplings, I haven't written the color factor associated to this diagram. I'm just focusing on the uh, integral structure, the structure of uh, the increment. So apart from uh, the V and mu that are traditional Dirac spinners, uh, here is the form of the, of the amplitude. V mu nu rho is the three gluon vertex, and if I dot on the indices right, so this is what the amplitude should be. As you see, we have uh, the denominators that contain the loop of momentum of these first three denominators. And that there, is, there are powers of the loop of momentum in the numerator too, both in this propagator, that is the propagator of the quark here, and uh, in the three gluon vertex uh, that we contain, of course, some powers of the momentum k, because it appears in the gluon max that go to that vertex. Now, I, I haven't written the form explicit of this vector, of this vertex, because we are not going to do the calculation. We just want to see what the structure is. You know the form of the three gluon now, out of this uh, main amplitude structure, clearly you get three kind of uh, vertex integrals. So, integrals with three denominators. You get integrals that have no powers of k in the numerator, and this is the one in this formula, and this corresponds to the C0, that is the scalar integral. Right? You get uh, integrals that have one power of k in the numerator, when uh, it's either this k or the k coming from the three gluon vertex, uh, and this is the, the C1, that of course carries a large index uh, here. Or uh, you can have two powers of k, one from this propagator and another from uh, the uh, three gluon vertex that we have here. And in that case, you will have a C2 function, what we call a C2 function, with two large indices, mu and mu, from the two moment. So the structure of the integral that you get is reproduced here when I call globally the denominator as D3, which is a function of P1 and P2. Now it's clear that these integrals, uh, C2 has interval divergences, uh, and it's clear to see that uh, because by power counting you see that you have six powers of k in the numerator and six powers of k in the denominator, so you expect the logarithmic divergence there. For the infrared structure, it's a little bit trickier, but you can easily see if you do this little shift here that the denominators that you start with, which is this one, becomes a denominator that of the form of k squared, k minus p1 squared, k plus p2 squared. And uh, if you assume the two quarks as massless, so p1 <coughs> square and p2 square as zero, then uh, what you get at the end uh, is, uh, is something that looks like uh, k square k dot p1 k dot p2. So this, uh, this uh, structure here also has for k0 going to zero soft divergences, and for k dot p1 and k dot p2 going to zero a collinear divergence. So that's what we expect from the integration that we have there. Now, if we look now at uh, the structure of the, of the two integrals that we have so in the sorry. If uh, k goes to zero, then also the, for the C2, k mu, k mu uh, denominator, of in the numerator is going to be zero. So how do you know that there's a big Well, uh, the, in that case, yeah, yeah, that's true. And in that case, you also have uh, by power counting, right? Uh, you have a situation in which you have, uh, you have the same power in the numerator denominator, so you still get a divergence, a soft divergence. When the k dot p1 and the k dot p2 dot goes to zero on the other hand, it's just the pure denominator that goes to zero. So, um, now, to go back to the two tensor integrals that you have to calculate, and which are the one with one index and with two inks, so c1 mu and c2 mu, here is a simple example of how you can go and reduce them to scalar integrals. This uh, reduction that we are going to illustrate here is a reduction that has been proposed originally by Passarino and Bellman, and is the, probably the oldest kind of reduction that we know of, and the most traditional one. And it has some drawbacks that I'm going to illustrate in the next responses. So it's just very uh, useful and it's still used on a very, on a very, for a very broad uh, series of application, uh, but sometimes it requires some uh, uh, modification. However, from a pedagogical point of view, it's very easy to understand how you reduce, using this method, how you reduce tensor intervals to scalar intervals. So take the two uh, tensor intervals that we have in our calculation. The first one has one Lorentz index, the second one has two Lorentz index indices. You can write them uh, in full generality as a linear combination of uh, terms, uh, each one, uh, in, in each one of which the Lorentz index is carried, either by the external momentum, 
in your denominator that are the only things that will be uh, independent at the end of the calculation of your scalar integral, the only thing your, your uh, loop integral can depend on. Or if you have two indices, of course, you can also have, use the matrix tensor, the junior matrix tensor. So for the first one, it's very easy. You can have just a linear combination of P1 mu and P2 mu with associated <coughs> coefficient. For the second integral, you can have all the possible uh, binomial if you want in P1 and P2, so P1 mu, P1 mu, P2 mu, P2 mu, and so on. And you can have a term that is proportional to G mu. Now, this coefficient you can find just by saturating all the tensor structure that you have in here. You get a sort of vector matrix vector equation for each one of them. The first one will give you C11 and C12, and we saturate this integral with uh, P1 mu, or you saturate this integral with P2 mu. But for instance, when you saturate it with P1 mu, if you assume P1 equal to 0, P1 squared equal to 0, you get on the left hand side just uh, C12 times P1 of P2. Right? And on the right hand side, you get an integral that you can reduce. You get an integral in which in the numerator you have k dot p1, but k dot p1 can be written as a linear combination of the denominators, and so you can reduce it to a linear combination of two point functions plus the scalar integral c0. Okay? The same or more complicated you can do for c2, of course, you have to now uh, saturate with structure that have two Lorentz indices that are exactly the same five structure or four structure that you have in this expansion. If you so do it, this can be done on a piece of paper, you will get uh, these two answers. So you get an answer for C11 that, as you see, is a function of C0, so the scalar integral with three denominators, and is a function of B0s that are the two-point functions with denominators, uh, having as denominators pairs of the denominators of C0. So B012 means that it has the first and the second denominator, B013 has the first and the third denominator, 2, 3, the second and the third denominator. So these are the three B0 that can be originated from C0. And this is what you get. So you see that you have reduced the calculation of C1 mu, that means the calculation of its tensor <coughs> coefficients, to scalar integrals of the same order or lower. So once you know the scalar integrals, you know the tensor integrals. So this is the first step. If your calculation has no problems, that kind of problems that I'm going to uh, expand on uh, in a further transparencies, this is what you can do. So you can have in your you can have a code that, that does that for you. So for all the tensor integrals that you have, you reduce them to a tensor structure of the form that you have here, which is uh, kind of unique. And uh, you calculate the coefficients that you have there through the passive vector reduction, for instance. And at the end, the only building blocks that you have to introduce in your calculation are just the scalar integrals. And those are the only objects that you have to calculate and live. Now, uh, once you have done that, of course, uh, the whole thing is uh, the amplitude that you had originally reduces uh, to something, uh, of course, you proceed in your, in your calculation, or once you know how to calculate the tensor integrals and reduce them to scalar integrals, you proceed in the calculation of your amplitude as you have learned for QT. So for each one of these uh, integrals, uh, you shift the momentum in such a way to obtain the denominator in the form that is a quadratic form, <coughs> you shift the momentum, you shift the numerator accordingly, and you apply just the traditional formula for two dimensional integrals that is written here. And if you so do for the simple diagram that we had on the previous transparencies, uh, this is the final answer that you get, uh, where you see the presence uh, of both ultraviolet divergences as you expected uh, and infrared divergences uh, as uh, we had argued. Now, at the same time, uh, we did not know to start with that the entire diagram would come out uh, proportional uh, to the Born amplitude. Uh, this is just because it's a particularly simple diagram, this happens. Right? In more general, in full generality, this is not the case. It is always the case uh, that uh, the singular part of the diagram comes out of proportional for the ultraviolet part, proportional to the full Born amplitude, for the infrared part, proportional to the full Born amplitude or to pieces of the full Born amplitude, not always to the entire Born amplitude. For the final part, that's not normally the case. So for the final part, it's normally not proportional to the Born amplitude. In this particular easy case, it was. So here I just wanted to give it to you to show explicitly what the result of the calculation should be and to show what the singular part that you have to cure are coming in. So the cure for this we already know. The cure for the ultraviolet are the counter terms of QCD. The cure for the infrared part is not there yet. We need first to calculate the real part and then to show that they cancel. Now, <coughs> here is the slide of the problems that may arise in applying the Passarino Vermeer reduction to calculate uh, tensor intervals. Now, the problem is just that uh, we haven't, as you notice, uh, in uh, looking at the formulas that you have here, there is a quantity that appears in the denominator that is this P1 dot P2 that is very um, harmless uh, in this case, uh, but it can be very harmful in other cases. Uh, 
And that object has, is a very particular object that is called the ground determinant of that uh, reduction uh, system of equations uh, that uh, you end up with, uh, you saturate with all the tensor structures that you have uh, in the expansion of the tensor integrals. And what this determinant is, 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 exact, is the determinant of a matrix uh, that is made of the dot product of uh, the external moment of the independent <coughs> external moment. Okay? So now, <coughs> In our case, for our process, that would not just be P1 or P2. Now, for uh, the um, particular case that we had, that is no problem. When you go to a larger number of denominators, uh, you may end up uh, with numerical instabilities because the ground determinant uh, is function of the momentum. So for instance, for a 2 to 3 process, uh, you have a P1 plus P2 going to P3, P4, and P5. This is a, the ground determinant is a function of the dot product of P1, P2, P3, and P4. And uh, what you end up with is that when you look at the specific structure of this object, you see that it's a function of uh, the kinematic observable, that the kinematic variables that you use in order to parameterize this moment. So for instance, the function of the energy of P3 and P4, and it's a function of uh, the asymptotal and theta uh, uh, angle of uh, P3 and P4. So when some of these momentum become degenerate, uh, this can go to zero. Now, when you have a determinant, when you have processes in which you have uh, <coughs> many denominators uh, that uh, therefore hits with, uh, with more probability having many momentum, the stream region of phase space, or when you have a higher rank integrals, so that therefore comes in with higher power of the ground determinant in the denominator. In the example that we saw before, we just look at the coefficient of the C1 object. Had we looked at the coefficient of C2, we would have seen here two powers of P1 and P2. So the number, the powers of the ground determinant that come in your calculation increases with the rank of the integrals, just because that is uh, from the reduction that we just saw. And uh, in that case, uh, this uh, particular is this instability in which uh, the determinant the, the that appears in the denominator of the coefficient goes almost to zero, so it becomes very, very small. It looks like a divergence in your mechanical calculation. So by the time you have finished your uh, analytic calculation, you want to input your analytic calculation into a code, a Fortran code, a C code, whatever, to get the numbers, so to get the value of the cross-section. Uh, if you say this diagram is, is equal to this uh, particular linear combination of terms, and some of these terms contains the reduction of your original tensor integral to scalar integrals, and therefore contains power, inverse powers of the ground determinant in the denominator, those objects are numerically are going to be by singularity. So they're going to give you things, they're going to give you results that oscillates widely because there is a little quantity that is almost going to zero, although it will never go to zero because strictly speaking uh, it's not zero, but numerically it looks like a zero. So this is why we call these uh, spurious divergences they're not really divergences, uh, they, they are objects that actually you can uh, tame if you want, uh, or you can eliminate even, but you're able to put together all the terms of your calculation. So if you were able to sum analytically all the terms coming from all the different diagrams, or gauging by a subset of diagrams, you will see this object uh, going away. So you will see this kind of instability going away. But uh, since typically you don't do that because you would like to optimize your calculation in such a way that you don't have to look in, in the face of the sum of diagrams, you want just to calculate each individual diagram by itself and just input it to your final code, then this will stay as sort of screws that it and, and close the variable instability. So you have uh, many possible alternatives, some of which are listed here that are the easiest one or the most uh, intuitive one to understand uh, given the discussion that we had this morning. Uh, you can uh, eliminate uh, the tensor integrals, uh, trying to eliminate the tensor integrals uh, by saturating them as much as possible uh, in calculating not the amplitude for the process but the amplitude squared. The reason why we typically would like to work as much as possible as far as the at the Utavard and infrared divergences go with the amplitude and not the amplitude squared, so not the virtual amplitude interfere with the bore, but just the virtual amplitude is because the pressures are smaller. If you may imagine as soon as you interfere with the bore, no, you get a lot of terms, because it's a very large expression. Now, it's true that you do this typically with computer codes, but still, uh, you need to keep a kind of close control of the structures that are coming out of your calculation till you have cancelled all the divergences, and if you can keep that control at the level of an amplitude that has a much smaller number of terms, it's much nicer. Now, if uh, this causes a level of instability, one possibility you have is just to go brute force, just to interfere that with the board. And of course, when you interfere with the board, you will generate, you will saturate all the k's that are in the numerators with an external momentum. And many of them 
will simplify with the denominators and you reduce typically at least by one or two orders uh, the rank of the tensor integrals that you have. And this may cure the problem. Tensor integrals may even disappear if the calculation is very simple. <coughs> this not, may not work normally, uh, always. And so what you can do is a not very elegant way of doing that, but it has been used in many calculations, and just to impose little kinematic cuts to avoid the regions where momentum becomes degenerate and cause the spools divergence. Those little cuts are imposed in such a way to calculate things in a safe region and then you extrapolate into the unsafe region with different algorithms <coughs> and you check the independence of your procedure. A more elegant way has been to adopt a different dispersion of the coefficients uh, that has been proposed by the authors here in two different kinematic regimes. And so to formalize, if you want, uh, the method that you apply here more rigorously. So you have, on top of this, uh, there are things that I will mention in my next lectures uh, that uh, adopt a completely different approach, so does not use personal momentum reduction, uh, so use different things, uh, and uh, therefore avoid uh, that kind of problems, although maybe sometimes you face other kind of problems. But this is something that you have to keep in mind uh, in, uh, uh, if you are really interested in uh, next to the calculations, the next to the calculations are very likely you will be looking at uh, if you have to do them, not just use packages that have already done them, but by, by but what is left to be done nowadays is typically very complicated and of course for sure you'll be faced with a problem like this one. Let's come to real corrections. Now when you come to real corrections, uh, now you have to calculate the amplitude square of, the, of process that has one part or more in the final state. Now the one part or more can be a blue one, can be a core, can be an anti core so for the process that we have here at hand, you see that we have all cases, and I have sketched here a sample of diagrams of the real emission. So you have emission of an extra gluon, <coughs> or you have a here, or you can have emission of also of an extra quark or an anti quark. The initial state is a state that now is different from the original state, initial state that we had in the living order. But I just give you bar and blue. When you go up one order, you can introduce the new initial state, and here you see that we have a new process that is a Q or Q bar blue process. So this produces an extra Q or Q bar in the final state. I call K the momentum of the extra part. Now here you see that in order to get all the alpha S corrections, you need <coughs> to take the uh, interfere the real amplitude that I uh, named the A1 real uh, with itself. So you have to square the real amplitude. And this is what you do, and in order to get the full cross-section, then you integrate over a phase space that contains the extra part. Now, the kind of singularity that uh, you can get out of here, they're all related to this little propagator. So they are related to the propagator of uh, the length that emits uh, the extra part. And they all come uh, into this uh, invariance that I call SIK. And SIK, for me, is just uh, the dot product of uh, PI, which is the momentum that emits the extra part, uh, times K, which is the momentum of the extra part. So it's a dot product of PI and K with a factor of 2, which is for complete. Now, if you look at, if you parameterize uh, the PI and K in terms of energy and momentum, then what you see is just that uh, this is equal to the product of the two energies times the factor that is 1 minus uh, beta, the cosine of the angle between I and K, where beta is the square root of 1 minus uh, <coughs> sorry, the mass square of the particle I divided uh, the energy square. Now, in here you see immediately two types of singularity emerging. So the amplitude for the real emission will be singular every time these objects appear in the denominator. And as we see, they will appear in the denominator. And every time when they appear in the denominator, either the energy of the middle part, so the K0 goes to zero, and in that case we have <coughs> what we call a soft divergence, or the angle between the middle part and the emitter goes to zero. And in that case we have a collinear divergence when beta i is equal to zero. So when the emitter is massless. So the emission from massless lens, uh, like for instance the quark and the anti quark and the blue that we have in this process that we have assumed massless, uh, can generate both soft and collinear divergences. The emission for a massive lens, like the final one at the top and the at the top, can only generate soft divergences. Now, <coughs> as far as uh, the soft singularity is <coughs> go, so, so as far as both both for soft and collinear singularity, we actually can calculate them. So we can calculate the singularity of the real emission using uh, a particularly nice property of uh, uh, the amplitude, the real amplitude, which is that, uh, <coughs> or if you want, of, of the real cross-section, which is the fact that both at the level of the amplitude and at the level of the phase space, uh, the presence uh, of a soft or a collinear object uh, factorizes. 
So the amplitude to factor out in the soft and collinear limit factor out, factor out a, the tree level amplitude, the times the factor that we can uh, then collect and use it as a uh, collinear or uh, soft factor. And the phase space <coughs> factor out of the phase space, so the phase space of the two plus one particles, factor out of the phase space of the <coughs> one, so factor out of the phase space of either the soft or the collinear object. Here we looked at the soft limit. So in the soft limit, we see exactly what I was saying. Now we see that uh, the level of the amplitude of the sigma bar always denotes the, the sum over the final degrees of freedom and the average of the initial degrees of freedom. So the amplitude square uh, with one extra part of here, I use the blue one as an example, factor out uh, the born amplitude square times a factor that is uh, traditionally called the Eichmann factor that I represent here. Well, what this is, uh, is uh, just as you see, an object mm -hmm. that uh, for, uh, in full generality uh, here I put also terms that depends on the mass of the emitting particles because we have tops in our problem, so we can add some of these cases. But in general, in the denominators, as you see, it depends on those uh, SI, um, sorry, here I forgot to substitute the G in the case. So this is SIK, SJK, and then you have a term in SIK squared, and a term in SJK squared. So it depends on two powers, uh, two uh, invariants of the form that we had on the previous transparencies. So the square, if you want, of invariants of the form that we had in the previous transparencies. So clearly you see when the energy of the k, so the k0 goes to 0, you see here the presence of soft analysis. By the time you integrate over a phase space, that as you see also factor out. You factor out uh, the phase space uh, of the extra part of the soft part. So the true integral that you have to calculate in order to calculate the infrared part of this amplitude is the integral over the phase space of the middle part of the factored out, the factorized expression of the amplitude that we have here. So the eigenal factor times the Born square. So actually, is the integral of the DPSG of the Eichmann factor that we have. We don't have time to go over the details of how this is done, but for your convenience, here is a reminder to you of how you calculate the Eichmann factor, what the Eichmann factor is coming from. The same as in QED, so this should be very familiar to you. Emission from an initial lag, emission from a final lag. When you take the soft limit, how do you get the Eichmann factor that you have in the most transparent? So we get to the collinear limit. The collinear limit, which is the case in which a part of I emits a part of I prime and the collinear part of G, so the extra part of I also think as a glue in this example, <coughs> in such a way that they are almost parallel one to the other. So in such a way that uh, in zero approximation uh, they are just a fraction uh, and one minus the fraction uh, of the momentum of the parallel part. So if you do this, uh, if you work out the kinematic that I spelled out for you in S transparency, so if you don't know the other object that go to the next transparency and use that part of the transition and do the calculation, it's very simple. You will see that uh, the uh, amplitude square, again, a factor out of the born amplitude square, you have to pay attention to the primes, because of course the born amplitude uh, is a born amplitude in terms of the I prime object that you have here times a factor that is expressed in terms of the splitting function of part of i into part of i prime. So the Atarelli Parisi function from the splitting of i into a prime, and in the denominator here comes the singularity that we expect. So the singularity in the invariance p i dot k. The phase space on its side also factored, there is some extra z factor that appears in this factorization, but fundamentally what you get here is that you get factorization of the phase space of the extra part of the method, and again, <coughs> When you go back to the original integration, which is the product of uh, the integration of the DPS to G and uh, the uh, real part um, of the real amplitude square, what you get is just that uh, everything reduces to the integration of the original 2 to 2 phase space uh, of uh, an integral uh, that is just the integral of the extra part uh, of the dynamic coming from the extra part uh, over the phase space of the extra part. And this is how you calculate the collinear part of the reference. So you can really calculate the soft and the collinear part of your divergence as proportional to the goal. And this is something that you need because as you remember from the virtual part, in the virtual part we said that the infrared divergences were coming exactly in that form. So in the form of poles in one over epsilon, one over epsilon square times the board of parts of the board. And this is exactly what is coming out from the real part. So the idea, as I say here, is now to calculate the singular part of the real cross section and uh, cancel them again uh, against uh, the infrared part of the virtual cross section and whatever is safe 
in the real cross-section, whatever is not is neither uh, soft nor collinear can be calculated uh, just uh, numerically. So you can integrate over that, not necessarily with an analytic integration. In the TT bar case, you can still do that probably because it's a two to three phase space. When you get to processes that have more particles in the final state, it becomes really hard to do the analytic calculation over phase space. And it's not convenient. It's not convenient because uh, imagine now that you have to be a little bit more flexible uh, and adapt to some experimental observable and therefore put cuts on uh, the properties of the outcoming particles that you have. What to do phase space integrals with four external particles and cuts, uh, it's hard, it's really hard. And uh, if an experimentalist come and tell you let's change the cut a little bit, uh, you have to do it again, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's really not convenient. So typically, what we aim at is a program that will integrate uh, eventually on the phase space of the final particles numerically. Now, we can do that, but we can do that provided we isolate the divergent pieces, because clearly we cannot integrate over those numerically. And this is exactly what we are doing here. We are isolating the divergent pieces, to cancel them against the virtual part of the cross section. Whatever is left is finite, and you, need, you can integrate over that numerically using methods that you have probably already heard about in this lecture, but we'll comment again about them in the next lecture. The next lectures. So let me just uh, overview for you which kind of methods uh, you can use in order to integrate over the real part. Uh, how much time do I have? Huh? Five minutes? Sure. Okay. <coughs> so, You'll find many more details about this method in the following transparency, but probably, however, I will not have time to comment in detail. Uh, we can ask you more probably during the uh, evening session, if you like. But here is an um, uh, uh, outline of which kind of method you can use in order to isolate these similarities so that appear in the real cross section. You can use a method that is called the face face method. But, uh, and uh, best review you can look at the first reference that uh, is implemented that is uh, reported here for the method that is called the two cutoff method and uh, other very good reviews for another method that is the one cutoff method uh, is indicated here or you can use a subtraction so let me briefly sketch what are the properties of this method let me sketch it uh, for the cutoff method for the, uh, for the phase space lasting method let me sketch it with a method that has two cutoffs that is more uh, intuitive I would say, and easier to explain. The middle with one cutoff uh, is very easy to explain, but it has subtle points that we don't have time to comment about now. It's in the transparency if you want to do that. Now, the two cutoff method uh, is based on the introduction of two cutoffs, as it says. And these two cutoffs uh, are one soft and one collinear one, and they are used to separate exactly what we want. So they are used to separate the soft divergences and to separate the collinear divergences. How do we do that? Well, we organize the cross section uh, into three pieces. Uh, one that is the soft piece, and that is done by introducing the cutoff delta S that uh, divided uh, the soft energies of the gluon uh, from the no soft energy of the gluon, so from the hard energies of the gluon. Now, this is easy to do. Now, the next step that you have to take is in the hard part, so whenever the gluon is hard, you want to separate whatever is collinear from whatever is not collinear, and therefore you introduce a second cutoff that does that for you. You separate the collinear part of the cross section just by defining that to be whatever is hard, so it's not soft, but such that the angle is small, from whatever is hard and non-collinear, so the one is not soft, but is also not collinear. And the four of the cross sections so divided into the three pieces, is divided into two pieces, the first two, soft and hard collinear, that are calculated analytically, using the, the uh, techniques that we were discussing, and the last part that is calculated numerically. This is the final part that I was mentioning to you, this is the true two to four part. As you may have noticed, uh, the hard, uh, the soft, and the hard collinear, uh, by the time uh, you are uh, through the calculation, reduce uh, to a <coughs> two to two process for our case. So it reduced to an integration over the phase space uh, that does not have the extra part anymore in the final state, uh, the soft or the collinear part, because you are integrated over that in order to extract the singularity. So the integration for these first two parts is exactly the same integration as the Born, is exactly the same integration as the virtual. The integration for the last part is typically the hard one because this is the truly one with an extra part. And this is the one that you really want to be able to do in America. And of course, the dependence on these two part of delta S and delta C, things are done correctly cancels in the final answer, and you can test that. Now, <coughs> the one kind of reason that I say I will skip, but let me illustrate a little bit the idea on the other hand of the subtraction method, which is the other alternative method that you can use, and actually the method that is mostly implemented into calculations that want to automatize the, um, the 
the one to automatize the procedure of an extra reading of the calculation. So it's good to know what this uh, comes to. Well, here the idea is uh, very simple uh, again, uh, and it goes back to isolate uh, the, if you want, uh, structure of these analytic pieces. So you look at uh, your real perception and you figure out uh, what the structure of uh, the pieces that are going to produce a sort of collinear divergence is going to be, and you introduce uh, a sort of uh, subtraction term that subtracted that exactly those structures. Now, the inter this uh, subtraction term that you have here, as you say, uh, as you see here, says that uh, the same similar behavior of this in j real, softer collinear behavior, at each phase based time point. And it has the nice property of being analytically integrable over the pattern, over the phase space of the extra pattern, in such a way that you can integrate it, which corresponded to the calculation of the softer collinear factor in the previous transparencies that we had. And when you integrate it, you produce what we call a subtraction counter term, which is what you have to add back in your calculation in order to have added some, not to have added something extra, right? So you subtract this piece from the real part unintegrated, and you add it back to the virtual part integrated over the phase space of the extra part. Okay? So those two pieces separately should be finite, and that's the reason why you can take the epsilon going to zero limit in both pieces. Now. <coughs> This, is, this uh, method here really does not depend on cutoffs. So, so once you have, once you are clear on how, and you have careful enough on how to choose the subtraction terms, uh, it has one less inconvenience, uh, which is the fact of uh, calculating the, of showing or checking the independence of the unphysical cutoffs that you introduce. It's to some degree more complicated to implement because you have to be very careful in uh, calculating the subtraction terms. So all this is spelled uh, in the transcript that we have here, and uh, a lot of work has been done uh, in recent years uh, on this method, uh, just because uh, it is the method that people wanted to implement in automated calculations, and the method that we are now uh, today um, is most uh, recommended, if you want, is the one in which the um, extra singular structure are isolated in so-called dipole structure. So when you hear about dipole subtraction method, this or dipole method, this is exactly what they mean. It's a subtraction method in which the extra soft and collinear singularities are isolated into structure that are of the form. So the subtraction term that we have introduced on in the previous transparencies has this nice structure. As a structure of uh, a dipole form, multiplied, that is exactly the form of the collinear and soft uh, factorization uh, terms uh, that we have illustrated in previous transparencies, uh, so with that one over SIK structure that we had before, multiplied uh, by the volume cross-section. And so you see here what the expression of the counter term should be, and if you look back a few transparencies, uh, you recognize in here exactly the factorization properties of soft and collinear singularities that we have, uh, that we have uh, uh, illustrated. So I will say that uh, since here we, get, we go to the more, uh, 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 to the comments about what we've seen, so we, the, the technical part of our uh, lecture is over. This is probably a good point in which we can, that we can shift to the next lecture that is on NLO tools. So we can start at that point commenting about uh, the uh, advantages of having an extra leading order calculation and then go into a series of examples in which we see that an extra leading order has gained us uh, everything we wanted, or cases in which national living order is not yet enough, and then from there we will move on to see what is available for us if we want to perform an national living order calculation, or if we want to use an existing national living order.